Good evening, everyone. Tana Koto. Welcome to another Auckland Conversations event. You're most welcome. The Auckland Conversations provide us an opportunity to inspire and stimulate your thinking about the challenges facing Auckland, and we have quite a few of those. But it's also a time for us to consider the opportunities that we have. And tonight we focus on the opportunity of Vision Zero uh, for safer streets for Aucklanders. Uh, my name is Lester Levy, and uh, I'll be facilitating the conversation this evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We uh, really appreciate your time. This is a really fantastic turnout. And we also welcome those who are joining us uh, for uh, live streaming. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. In the event of an emergency, pretty unlikely, an alarm will sound and will be directed out of the building uh, through the back way from, by our ushers. Uh, bathrooms are located at the back of the room to the left of the bar. And finally, could you please um, turn your mobiles to silent? That will be greatly appreciated. Uh, we really would like to acknowledge our event partner this evening. I feel slightly conflicted as I'm the chairman of Auckland Transport and the event partner is Auckland Transport. Uh, but we're very thankful to Auckland Transport for, <laughs> for their wonderful support. And, uh, yeah. and, and I could spend hours on them, but I won't. Uh, uh, we also really want to thank the Auckland Conversations event sponsor, uh, Racine, and all our program supporters. Um, we're very grateful for their support. Um, tonight we are joined by a group of panellists that represent sectors that are impacted by and taking action to address the high rate of uh, road crashes and serious incidents and the statistics that we're all aware of on our roads which uh, we find deeply concerning. And we will talk about the international approach called Vision Zero which has been successful in many other overseas cities and it's something that we're greatly interested in. The format tonight will be a discussion with our panellists, but we will start with a presentation from our esteemed visitor, Dr. Mats Billin, a Senior Policy Advisor with the Swedish Transport Administration and an international authority on uh, Vision Zero, and we're greatly privileged to have you uh, here with us tonight, Mats. You're welcome to tweet. Thank you. You're welcome to tweet during the evening. Use hashtag, um, uh, hashtag AKL conversations. If you'd like to join in the conversation, we'll be taking questions from the floor during a Q&A session that will follow directly after the panel discussion. So you might want to think about your questions, and when you do have a question, please keep it uh, brief. You can also ask questions via Twitter and through the hashtag feed and that'll be monitored as we go. If time allows, we'll include questions during the panel discussion and the QA from these sources. We'll always try to ensure that Auckland conversation events are inclusive and accessible. So there's on-demand viewing of the event, a full transcript and captioning of the event and presentation will be available on the Auckland Conversations website in the next few days, and you'd be encouraged to uh, have a look at that. So much has been said about the transport challenges faced in Auckland. It's growing by over 800 people per week, and with that, congestion continues to increase. We have had success in growing public transport, and we intend to do that a lot more around our region, and more people are choosing to cycle as safe infrastructure is delivered. But our network needs to be safe as well as efficient and 2017 has been a sobering, a really bad year for serious road incidents. Every week we hear of more people being seriously injured or sadly killed on their journeys. A street is safe for all users, drivers, walkers, and bike riders, and children in particular, and improves the health of those who use it. We know from international experience that the cities that are best at moving people efficiently are also the safest. A Vision Zero approach aims to achieve a transport network with no fatalities and serious injuries involving road traffic. So we need to be a lot more aspirational and it's important that we don't normalize the statistics that we have. We really gotta find it deeply unacceptable and this is a responsibility that we have to all take and share. 
Uh, it is an approach, Vision Zero, uh, that is, as I said previously, been taken in many international cities, and we look forward to having the conversation with Mats and our panelists. It's now my great privilege to introduce somebody who needs no introduction, and that's His Worship, the Mayor Phil Goff, a man with a great vision for Auckland, a great vision for transport, very supportive of what we're trying to do, and somebody who deserves our support as Aucklanders. Mayor. Uh, inga mana, inga reo, uh, e rauranga tera mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. And good evening and uh, welcome to Auckland Conversations tonight. Um, can I begin with an apology? Uh, I've managed to get myself triple booked tonight. Uh, three different speeches, but fortunately all in this building. So uh, I hope, Mats, I can hear the first part of your presentation before I need to, to rush off to, to the next uh, function I'm attending. Uh, I regret I can't be here for the whole thing because I think what we are looking at tonight uh, is a critical issue uh, for, for Auckland. It's literally a life and death issue. We celebrated for a long time a fall in the road toll. There was a time when 800 people or more a year were dying on our roads, and we thought we were on top of the problem, but in the last four years, the steady decline in road fatalities uh, has turned around, and we've seen a worsening trend. That is, nothing, that is something that we cannot be complacent about. That is something that we must address, and that is why tonight's meeting is so important. Could I first of all acknowledge our uh, Master of Ceremonies, Dr Lester Levy. Um, there are a lot of reasons why Lester is the ideal person to be the chair tonight. He is of course the chair of Auckland Transport and he understands the transport issues including road safety in Auckland as well as anyone from that perspective. But he's also the Chief Executive Officer of three district health boards, and he understands the consequences, the human and health consequences of failing to get on top of our road toll. So Lester, I'm looking to you, no pressure, I'm looking to you to make the recommendations of, around the actions that our council and our government need to enact in order to reduce and hopefully eliminate our road toll. I'd also like to welcome tonight the Chair of the Waitamata Local Board, Pippa Coombe. And Pippa and I were at a function last night and she was giving me a preview of tonight. And I know that she is an absolutely strong advocate uh, for the program that we are talking about tonight, Vision Zero. Can I also acknowledge other elected representatives that are here? I haven't been around everywhere, so I dare not start mentioning names because I will omit some, uh, but very good to have members of the uh, local boards around Auckland participating tonight. But of course, most of all, I'd like to welcome our special guest tonight, uh, Mats Ballin. Um, Mats is a, a citizen and a resident of Sweden, uh, but he has a very special role, and that is as an advisor to the Mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, uh, to the American federal government. I don't know whether he has any connection with the President, but if he does, good luck. Uh, um, and also an advisor to the United Nations uh, on this issue of Vision Zero. So we could not be more privileged to have a better speaker and a better insight into those topics. Vision Zero, of course, promotes the view that no loss of life on the roads is acceptable. Dr Bellin will explore how uh, Vision Zero works and what Vision Zero in Auckland could look like. Leastways, that's what I hope you're going to do, Mats. Uh, he'll share with all of us uh, road design and engineering solutions that will also make our roads uh, safer. Could I also, to begin with, acknowledge the members 
of the panel tonight and welcome them here. Uh, Andrew Allen, the Chief Transport Operations Officer at Auckland Transport, Carolyn Perry, the Development Director at Brake, and Dr Rhys Jones, uh, a Public Health Specialist at Auckland University. This afternoon, as I was just thinking about the event tonight, I had the opportunity to watch a video produced by Victoria Roads in Australia. I don't know whether any of you have seen it, but it's a particularly good video. They are doing an interview with a man. He could be any member of the general public. And he's told that the road fatality rate in Victoria last year, not 2016, was 200 and 91. He was then asked what would be a more acceptable number. And he shrugs, hadn't really thought about the question. He said, oh, maybe 70. Now, maybe he could be forgiven for that because 70 would be a quarter of the rate of road fatalities in Victoria last year. And then the facilitator of the meeting calls in 70 people to stand up at the front of an audience. And you see mums, dads, children. You see grandparents, you see grandchildren, you see members of the family, and you see their faces. And they are not statistics. They are human beings. And the man, as any of us would in his position, looks absolutely devastated. And he's asked the question again, what would be an acceptable number? And he gives the answer that I hope all of us would give tonight, and that acceptable number is zero. I, along with many other New Zealanders, have confronted the tragedy of road fatalities in my own family. I was in my early 20s, and I was pallbearer for a niece, age seven, at a funeral in which my uncle was also buried. And they called it a road accident. But it wasn't an accident. He and his daughter were killed by a person that chose to drink and then to drive. It was no accident. It was almost an inevitability at the amount of alcohol that he had consumed. It was the deliberate act of drinking and driving, and that is one of our major problems. Speed on the road. And probably, if we're honest, we're all guilty of that. It's about inattention. It's about poor road design and other factors. All of them lead to disastrous consequences. I looked up the statistics for Auckland. In Auckland, one person on average a day gets hit by a motor vehicle while they're out walking. And every third day, that person dies or is seriously injured. Last year, in Auckland, there were 46 people killed on our roads and 610 seriously injured. These are not statistics. These are human beings. And every one of those 46 people who died was an absolute tragedy for their friends and their family. There's a lot that we can and must do to prevent this. And tonight's discussion, I hope, will point to the directions we need to follow to achieve Vision Zero. It's not that it hasn't been tried elsewhere. Stockholm and New York have both shown just what can be achieved when we approach this problem with absolute determination. There are, of course, costs associated with implementing Vision Zero. But you can guarantee that those costs are nowhere near the magnitude of the human and social costs of the carnage on our road and even the economic consequences which run into billions of dollars. 
So thank you very much for coming along here tonight. Uh, thank you, Mats, for being our special guest speaker tonight. And thank you to all of the panel members. And I'll ask you to join with me in welcoming those people to tonight's Auckland Conversations. Nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Okay, a very clear message from the Mayor tonight. Um, it is an interesting time for us at Auckland Transport because quite independent of this, uh, we have a board-led um, review of the approach at Auckland Transport to road safety, and it's almost the perfect intersection. And uh, realistically, um, we will have to face a lot of tough decisions about resource reallocation but we have to and we must take this more seriously. Um, Dr. Mats um, Berlin is the Senior Policy Advisor in the Swedish Transport Administration. He has a long history working with the Swedish government and primarily with safety policies, strategies and collaborations. He's worked for the World, World Health Organization where he participated in the development of global road safety strategies and partnerships. He's chaired technical committees in the World Road Association. He is um, a senior policy advisor, as I've said, to the Swedish Transport Administration and responsible for the development of Vision Zero Academy. He's also affiliated as a professor at the KTH Royal Technology Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. He's a Swedish delegate to the UN Road Safety Collaboration and the international representat representative at the US Transportation Research Board. Uh, and we could go on, but we won't. Uh, we have a real privilege tonight to hear from Mats, but before we do so, we're going to take just a few minutes to play a video. It is Australian, but it's not the same video that the Mayor was referring to. It's a short video that shows the work of the Towards Zero campaign in New South Wales. Decisions are made every day about safety, and this is a confronting challenge. So we'll have that briefly, and then we'll welcome Mats to the stage. Thank you. Last year, 380 people died on our roads. What would be a more acceptable number? Acceptable? 70, maybe? Actually, this is what 70 people looks like. It's my family. So now, what do you think would be a more acceptable number? Zero. Zero. Welcome back. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for all these warm and welcome words. It's great to be here in New Zealand. I've been here since uh, Tuesday last week. I've been in Nelson and Auckland, and, uh, and New Zealand has been a fantastic host for me <clears throat> during this time, and I learned a lot from, from you also, guys. But I tried to be here to, to um, share some of the experience that we have now from Sweden and from other countries. And I must confess that my collaboration with the U.S. started before this uh, the administration we have in, in place now. So, so we wait and see what's happening, actually. But there are lots of uh, interesting things happen all over the world, I would say. Yeah, I think there is a kind of culture evolutions going on now around, around the world. Or well, I could call it a global revolution. You know, when we introduced the cars in our society, uh, we, we thought that it's up to every individual to survive in a harsh environment. But then most countries, at least in the Western world, we start to think that no, we have to do something about this, this problem. But we thought that we have to accept some victims. It's a kind of price that we have to pay for our mobility. But now, Around the world, you see more and more, just like the film you, you, you just saw, that people get into it can never be acceptable 
that people get killed and serious injuries within our transport system. And I think in 1997, when the Swedish parliament adopted Vision Zero in Sweden, that was the first time when that was really uh, on the agenda. And today, we in Sweden, we celebrate the 20th anniversary with, with uh, Vision Zero. And, but it's not only about an ethical imperative. Vision Zero is actually, it's a paradigm shift in the way that we work with safety. Uh, one way for me to explain these differences is to uh, talk about how we used to do it, the more traditional way to work with safety. And the traditional approach to safety, the problem that we try to solve is a problem with accidents. And we know from in-depth studies that 90% of all accidents or crashes is due to human factors. That is kind of mantra, and it's been there since the introduction of the car. When I see some of the uh, inquir committee inquiries from 1920s in Sweden, I can read this, you know. They say that 90% is due to the human factors. And therefore, in most countries in Asia, we have put the ultimately responsibility on safety on us and individual road users. So if something goes wrong out there, you can always find someone to blame. And our strategies has very much been focused on trying to creating the perfect human being who is always doing the right thing all the time. And our strategies has also been very much uh, based on the idea that people don't want safety. We have to educate them, we have to enforce them, we have to regulate them. And we don't think that we can eliminate this problem. We are quite happy if we can step by step reduce the risk, but we think that this is a price that we have to pay for our mobility. There is a kind of optimum of fatalities and serious injuries. And I would say that Vision Zero as a policy challenged all this aspect, all this dimension when it comes to our policy. The first thing in a Vision Zero uh, framework, the problem that we try to solve is not the problem with the accident per se. The problem that we try to solve is the problem that people get killed and serious injuries. That is our focus. And the reason why people get killed or serious injured, according to our Vision Zero approach, is, due, is, is because people are people. We have young people, we have old people, we have all kinds of people using our transport system. And people mis make mistakes. And instead of hoping that we can create this, this perfect human being who's doing the, the right thing all the time, we, we have to accept that we have to create the system for humans instead. And people are fragile. We know quite a lot now how much kinetic energy our body uh, tolerates without any fatalities and serious injuries. So let me take an example. If you have a typical four-lane intersection and you have a problem in that intersection, the traditional pr approach to solve problem in that intersection is to put up a traffic light. And the number of crashes will be reduced due to that traffic light. But the typical scenario is that someone, by mistake, go against the red light, and due to the high speed, the outcome will be very severe. But if you have a roundabout, the crashes actually might increase a little bit because it becomes a little bit more difficult to drive in a roundabout, but those who will happen will be less severe. So a traffic light and a roundabout might actually be the difference between life and death. So therefore, in a Vision Zero approach, in framework, the ultimately responsibility for safety is put on us as system designer. Of course, the road users still have a responsibility, but if something goes wrong, it goes back to us as system designer. 
That's why also, for example, in Sweden we started to move a problem, just like the mayor said, drink and driving. We start to move that problem from a be uh, only a behavior problem to a design problem. So we think that in the future you will have some kind of device in your car that will prevent you from drink and driving, alcoholic and other kind of technology. And this kind of technology will be as common as a seatbelt. So we move that problem to, from a behavior problem to a design problem, I would say. Vision Zero is also very much based on the idea that people want safety. When we know the options, when we know what, what, what we can choose between, we have noticed that people, there is a potential, a real potential for demand for safety. And I think the best example we have on, on this in Europe and Sweden is our EURANCAP, the, the car assessment program. Because usually, in, traditionally and historically, the industry and the government, they have negotiated about a kind of standard for, for safety for, for the cars. And you know, when you have that kind of nego negotiation, you will, <clears throat> the, the things, the outcome from that kind of discussion will be a minimum of standard. But as experts, we know that some of our cars, they will really just be above that standard. And some of them will be really safe. But as a consumer, we don't know. We don't know this. So this car assessment program really tells that these cars is five star and these car is one star. And, and when we tell people about this, we see how the market dramatically changed almost overnight, I would say. And the same when it comes to urban traffic. When we start to talk with parents and others that using the, the system every day, uh, we can see a huge demand actually for safety. And of course, in the long run, we would like to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries. This was actually what the Swedish uh, parliament adopted in 1997. But you all know that is a white paper, uh, words on a paper. It's a total different story to get from words and ideas to implementation. Unfortunately, we have been able to do, do that in Sweden. And I will now give you some example on how this kind of philosophy have, have a dramatic impact on how we work with safety, both in the urban area and in, in the rural area. And in the late 90s, it started with the municipalities, I would say. Uh, this is a typical uh, Swedish municipality. At least you have a sidewalk and uh, you have the zebra crossing. And the default speed in this environment is 50 kilometers. And no one really thinks that there ain't any problem in this situation. They think it's OK, you know. But we know as experts that if you get hit by a car in 50 kilometers, the risk that you can kill is more than 80%. And if you get hit by a car in 30 kilometers, the risk is less than 10%. So it's a huge difference between 30 40 or 50. But we as a driver, we don't understand this, you know. We can drive in 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. We have no perception at all when it comes to kinetic energy. We don't really understand that. But if we could transform this situation to something that we really understand, the risk with height, it would look like this, you know. So you can imagine what kind of demand on, on um, interventions if people understand this, you know. And this zebra crossing is extremely dangerous, actually. And this is what we actually have every day, every time we are out in the road transport system now. And the whole, um, to take care of this safety now between this unprotected road user, we, we, it's only up to us to negotiate 
about safety in this situation. So when we start to talk with our road engineers in municipalities about this, this problem, because basically this is really the scientific evidence, the scientific base for Vision Zero, these, the, these risk curves. And we start to talk with uh, municipalities, we, saw, we can see a dramatic uh, change of how they do their business, I would say. If you go back in late 1990s and, and compare how it looked like now, you will see lots of speed bumps, lots of uh, 30 kilometers uh, zones. You will see lots of traffic calming, um, shared spaces where you give priority to unprotected road users. You will see lots of roundabouts. And everything is about controlling for harmful energy, I would say. Even here you have some new kind of uh, solutions. Uh, 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 actually, if you drive too fast, the, the, the a radar will detect it, and it will be the um, the thing there will go down, and it will be like a bump, you know. And okay, you do it once, once maybe, then you never do it again, you know. So it's a very easy thing, but if you keep the speed, because this is very important for public transport and so on. If you keep the speed, then you will not feel anything. So, so that's one way to kind of nudge people to do the right thing. You know. But it's not only in the urban area. We have done lots of things. Yeah, um, also because here in Auckland, I think there's lots of discussion about is it possible to have uh, roundabouts when you have bicycles, uh, cyclists, and so on. And uh, this is a good example on how we design things. Uh, that also accommodate for, for cyclists. There are lots of uh, ex examples now that we can really do a good design of things. But, but in the rural area now, uh, we have, used to have lots of these roads. And if you calculate the number of crashes per kilometer driven, uh, uh, the road en engineers, they will say that this is a safe road. But if you calculate the number of fatalities and serious injuries per kilometer road, these were our death roads. You know. And traditional, we try because and the the major problem is head on head on collisions on this road. And the traditional way to try to solve it was through education, to to tr try to teach uh, the drivers how to make safe overtakes and use the police to enforce these kind of uh, roads. But to be honest, it really didn't work, actually. So an option could be, of course, to build a motorway, because we know that the motorway is very safe, but they are also very expensive. So in that time, it costs about one billion per save life with, with a motorway. So that was very expensive. But we come up with an innovation. We call them two plus one road. And I think you have some example of that here in, in New Zealand. And basically, sometimes you have two lanes, so you can make a safe overtake. And some, sometimes you have one lane. And then you go in the one lane for one kilometers. Then you get uh, two lanes. As a matter of fact, the, the difference in safety between those, those roads is, is about 90%. So this bill barrier will reduce the number of fatalities, serious inju injuries, up to almost 90%. And in the beginning, when we start to implement these, they cost us about 30 million per save life, instead of 1 billion if we have built the motorway. So this is an ex excellent example on when we take this idea about vision zero and controlling for harmful energy into reality, practice uh, solution. But of course, we can't put up middle barriers everywhere. So we also, right now, I would say we have, per population, one of the largest safety camera program in the world. And we expanded it because 
uh, and but we don't do any money on it. The, we, we don't earn any money, but we get the people to keep the speed with this system without ticking people. I can talk more about this uh, if if I got any question about it. So now around Sweden, we started with zero kilometers with this two plus one road, and now we have more than 3,000 kilometers. And we started with about 600 cameras, safety cameras, and now we have more than 3,000 cameras, and we're expanding in this program. Have you seen this book? You know, Ralph Neighbor, he was really a champion for safety in the late 60s and have a dramatic impact on how we work with safety around the world, I would say. And what he really did was to challenge the car industry when it comes to safety. And one of the outcome from his kind of uh, um, movement was that the US uh, set up this special agency for traffic safety, NHTSA. They're still around. And the same thing happened actually in Sweden. We were very influenced by US in that time. The thing is that this title now is wrong. That's a good news. Cars is not unsafe at any speed anymore. So if you if you have a modern car and you have a head-on collision with another modern car, uh, the car industry tells us that they will take care of the energy up to 80 kilometers. That's the good news. I don't think that a car in the late, late 60s could really handle this. So there are lots of knowledge and think, thinking implement in, in, in the cars that we have now. But if you want higher speed than 80 kilometers, you have to do something about your head-on collisions, and that's why you, you need to start to install a middle barrier. Uh, so in Sweden now, due to our program, that's really, it's not about safety, it's about safe mobility. That's a way for us to, to combine both safety and mobility. The investments that we do for our two plus one roads is not really for safety, it's for increased mobility. But sometimes we don't have the money to, to do this investment. Therefore, we have a huge program now to also lower the speed. Because we would like to see a system now that we have the design of the road, the wheel, vehicle safety, and the speed limits. They should go together. And we also working very much with the, uh, with the urban area now. So we probably will lower the, the um, urban default speed from 50 to 40 now due to this. So now we can see how this Vision Zero start to spreading uh, around the world. We call it a little bit, uh, we have different word for it. So sometimes we're talking about safe system or road to zero, towards zero, so, and so on. But you can definitely find references to this Vision Zero now in the UN Global Plan Decade of Action Plan. You will also find it in the, transport uni uh, the European Union trans white paper for transport. They're talking about close to zero 2050. Uh, last year, the OECD, they launched this report, Zero Road Death and Serious Injuries. The World Health Organization launched this report last year also. If you read this book, you will see lots of references to Vision Zero and Safe System approaches. And of course, now since 2014, the New York have adopted Vision Zero. And that's interesting, because now we see these large cities, they started to talk about Vision Zero. And in US, you know, uh, you will, now you have Washington, Boston, uh, San Francisco, there are lots of big cities that actually have adopted uh, uh, Vision Zero. 
And we can see that this also re gives results. For example, in Sweden now, if you take Sweden in general, uh, we have gone from about seven fatalities six uh, fatalities in 1997 to less than three fatalities per 100,000 inhabitants. And no one really thought that, that that was possible because we were already, when we started to implement our program, we, we were one of the best in the world already in that time. And you think that there are a kind of dimension of return if you do things. But you have to do things differently. Business as usual, yes. But here we have re reduced the number with more than 50% from a, being one of the top performers and all, uh, um, um, even from that perspective, uh, being able to, to reduce the number. And Stockholm, when we started, was 2.3 fatalities per 100,000 inhabitants. And now they are down to 0.4. And New York, who is a little bit later has started to work with these things, also have shown results. I was asked to give some references to my, what I think about New Zealand and Auckland. And of course, I've only been here for a little bit more than one week, so, so it's a little bit difficult for me to have a say about that. But. Um, uh, Andrew from uh, Transport Auckland, they took me out for, for <clears throat> out in the network a little bit. And, and uh, uh, this, I guess, is a quite typical kind of road in, in, in uh, New Zealand. And uh, you allowed 100 kilometers on this road. I would say that will not happen in Sweden anymore. Um, probably this road would be 80 kilometers, together with uh, safety cameras, probably. Um, it will not be Middlebury because it's too narrow, I think. But, but uh, that's the way that we should think about it. And w when we, I get into the, to the, to the city, uh, it strikes me when, when you Definitely, I think that Australia and also, uh, sorry, New Zealand, but also Australia and US, your society is much more car dependent than, than we are in Sweden and in, in Europe. But it's also quite interesting to see, for example, if you ask a pedestrian, if you cross a road here in, in the city, you know, and you just take one step and then you get this red um, uh, sign coming out to you, you know. It feels like they hate you. <laughs> and I wonder sometimes if I was an elder, peop elder people or an old people, you know. Uh, I'm quite fit, still quite fit, so I, I can manage to, 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 uh, um, to, to get over over the time, you know, but, but for older people it must be a, a very difficult, actually. But there is something in, in the way that we, and I think we, we, you will of course find it also in Europe, but not in, in the same extent, where there has been so focused on uh, the, the, the cars and, 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 uh, um, uh, and, and the car society. But the good news is that it's a very big potential for improvement, I would say. <laughs> so you have lots of things you can do, I think. But the most things, from a safety point of view, is about controlling for harmful energy. And why do you, do you need to do that? Because safety is not about safety. Safety is about mobility. And I think we all now is in a situation where we really need much more diverse transport systems. It's not about safety, it's about environment, it's about health. We would like to get people more on, on bicyclists and become cyclists and, and, and walking because that's good from the health and it's good from the environment point of view. But safety is a barrier for that to happen. 
as a parent, I don't want to put my kids out in an inherently unsafe system. And we can't manage our system through uh, uh, data like fatalities and serious injuries in that situation because uh, uh, the parents know that this is not a uh, not safe system. So we have to think outside the box. And we can't just chasing the, the, uh, the black spot that we call it, uh, fatalities and serious injuries. Because sometimes you have an unsafe system, but you have zero fatalities and serious injuries. But everything is about safe mobility, so you have to have a much broader perspective on it. But of course, Vision Zero as a kind of safety culture phenomena is very advanced. It's not, it's very advanced, you know. And, and it pushed for huge changes. So to make that happen, you have to be brave. And you have to have lots of discussion with, with your communi communities about these things. And our experience in Sweden now is that one way to do that is to start with demonstration project to show how it works and have a dialogue with all these uh, stakeholders that is in, in, involved in it. But my experience from Sweden also is that it's not really uh, the politicians has not been a problem. The public has not really been a big problem. It's us as professionals, actually. There's lots of things that we used to do uh, in a way, and we get used to it. Um, we use sometimes uh, standards, a manual that was developed in 1930, 1940. And I think the whole road engineering um, um, community is quite conservative, actually. If you compare with, for example, in the car industry, they're doing a new car model every two, five years, something like that. But here, sometimes we work with things that was fit with the car society in, in the 50s. So we have to change a lot of these things uh, to, to get it happen. But the good thing with this is that if you start to work systematically to reduce your death and, and serious injuries, that will um, contribute to safe mobility because that is what we actually would like to achieve. So I think I stop there and, and then we can have a chat in the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mats. Uh, that is definitely a narrative of possibility. Um, I think that we do have a problem in New Zealand that we hardwired to accept convenience over safety, so safety must trump convenience. But I'm going to ask Andrew Allen, Chief Transport Operations Officer from Auckland Transport, to join us. Uh, Caroline Perry, National Director of Break, please join us as well and Dr. Rhys Jones, a public health medicine specialist and a senior lecturer in Maori Health uh, from the University of Auckland to join us as well. So we'll constitute the panel. Um, I'll lead off. We'll have panel discussion for the next 20 minutes, and then we'll move to questions from the audience. Um, I was pretty struck by uh, some of the interventions, particularly, Andrew, the one relating to speed. Uh, if we lower speed limits on the road network, uh, won't that just add to congestion, the very thing that we're just trying to tackle? Your views, please. Uh, just checking that's obviously all working. Thank you, Lester. Um, I think it's probably very fair to say that really lower speeds are certainly caused by congestion but the converse is seldom true. So I don't believe that lower speeds, as of right, cause congestion on our networks. I don't believe that that is the case, to be honest. Um, in fact, there are some examples where, and I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate one of those. We have now, for the last four or five years, been rolling out a 40K speed zone around schools. That's a, a, a great 
initiative that's delivered us a 37% reduction in accidents involving children walking or cycling to and from schools, um, and really has had little or no impact on congestion whatsoever. Um, I think congestion, to be honest, is caused by a number of factors. Um, the capacity of the network to take the vehicles, the type of intersection treatments that you have on your network. <coughs> um, so those factors, I believe, are the ones that contribute primarily to our congestion. Speed is seldom a factor that we consider in terms of creating or generating more congestion. Um, yeah, and I think perhaps Thank we'll you. leave it at that. Uh, Matt did allude to uh, <clears throat> the real elephant in the room when it comes to congestion, and that is car dependency. So this is a very car dependent culture. Yeah. It is like a narcotic. We <laughs> uh, <laughs> are addicted. Uh, we're going to um, talk now a little bit, I think, with uh, Reese and Caroline, if we may. Um, Vision Zero isn't just about changing road design. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges of uh, changing people's attitudes to road safety? Um, I'll just check this is working too. Great. It is. Um, so uh, from our point of view, yes, we know that changing people's attitudes uh, and behaviours towards road safety is a really big challenge and um, th there's a lot of research that's been done from transport psychologists around that particular topic which says that there are so many factors which affect our attitudes and behaviours to things from um, peer pressure, the way we were brought up, our socio-economic factors, um, health and well-being at any particular moment in time which can affect our attitude to something or our behaviour at that particular time that there are a lot of factors which affect um, the way we behave and therefore it is a real challenge to change people's attitudes. But that's not to say that we shouldn't still be trying to raise awareness of what the road safety issues are, what the causes are behind them and um, what changes we need to make individually and collectively in relation to road safety to save lives on roads because we all have a responsibility and we can't be complacent. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, thanks, Lester. Um, I would say, and, and this was actually brought into quite sharp focus for me uh, personally the other day, the importance of not just uh, focusing on road design, but also the need to kind of transform attitudes and at a broader level sort of culture around this. Um, because I was uh, biking along a, a physically separated uh, cycle lane not far from here, and uh, a person driving a vehicle turned directly across my path, even though I thought I was clearly visible, um, clearly not. Uh, and so even though the road design was great, um, you know, something about the culture, something about perhaps not expecting to see cyclists around there because there are relatively few, um, you know, n not looking out for people other than in vehicles, you know, so, so those sorts of things are incredibly important. Um, and I think coming from it, at it from a public health perspective, as I do, uh, I think about things like, uh, you know, we've had a long experience in public health with trying to change people's behaviours around certain, you know, types of health behaviours, like smoking, for example. Uh, and we've worked out eventually that uh, hammering people with messages to stop smoking and uh, trying to educate people around this is um, really not working. And, and what we need to do is change environments. And so once we get smoke-free environments, once we get um, higher taxes on cigarettes, uh, we get you know, restrictions on advertising and sales of, uh, of tobacco, then we start seeing the improvements. And I think there's, there's huge parallels with, with the transport environment uh, that we need to, to focus on, uh, not just the physical environment, but also the sort of social cues, uh, the social norms, that people have, and, and so you know we can get that change in culture, even though that's you know sounds sounds easy rolling off the tongue, but uh, is a long term sort of process. But we won't get it unless we make a good start and be intentional. But that's a good segue. Thank you, Rhys, uh, for my next question, which is for Matts. What is the role of good urban design in helping to deliver Vision Zero? Uh, well, I think it's um, crucial <clears throat> to make it happen. 
as you said, it's sometimes it can be very difficult to to change the behavior and that sort of thing. And and, and uh, the urban design, well, it's basically it's about to um, influence the behavior, but through a more um, change in your environment. And um, and and um, let me also connect a little bit to the, the your question around um, congestion. I think the, I think it's the opposite actually. Uh, I think if if we make uh, a safe urban environment, the, then that will itself promote uh, more cyclists, more walking, and. Uh, so that will uh, a more public transport, and that it's itself will have a good impact on congestion. So, so I think it's the opposite, actually. Uh, sometimes, particularly from this part of the world, we look at the uh, Scandinavian countries, and they seem very progressive, and they seem to be able to make uh, steps that we don't easily make. Is there something particular in the culture? of the Scandinavian people that we could learn from. <laughs> Is there a particular gene for responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, usually I, thought I got that question, you know. And I think, yeah, we are very in innovative um, um, in Scandinavia. We, we would like to do things uh, in a different way, and we, we have a small country, but uh, that's the same in New Zealand. Uh, so, so we have a lots of discussion among different stakeholders, that sort of thing, and, and that I think creates the context of the, be in the front of, of uh, this sort of thing. But I don't think really that that, that there are different. Uh, individuals in, in different... I, I think we are quite um, uh, similar all over the world, actually. Well, that gives great hope for us. Uh, Andrew, there was a gentle or not so gentle challenge from Matt earlier uh, about uh, your profession, uh, transport engineers. Uh, I think if I was to interpret what he said is that you hardwired to orthodoxy and old-fashioned <laughs> textbooks is that correct? <laughs> um, I'd say it probably would be correct, but we are evolving. I, th I think we are evolving, and I think that there is a lot that we can learn from what else is happening around the world. And I think we're in a, in a place in time right now where technology also offers us some really fantastic solutions. I think one of the slides that you had up there was about the speed hump that kind of is dynamic. Yeah. So it's there or it isn't there, depending on your behaviour. You know, that sort of stuff five years ago just wasn't even thought of. So, mm -hmm. so I think as engineers, we've, we've got to be adaptive and we've got to be innovative and we've got to embrace some of those solutions that are offered to us by technology and, and the innovations. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we were to um, make a significant shift in our paradigm about road safety, um, we probably need to spend more on road safety. Uh, what do you think we can afford not to do? Well, I, I don't think it's even a question of what we can afford not to do. To be honest, we can't afford not to focus on road safety. Uh, you know, that's that's my view on it. Certainly, um, I think the and mayor that, and that's good, and we accept that. But where the rubber hits the road, so and where the budgets are allocated and competed over, seriously, what is it that we could afford not to do? Because we will face this choice, and quite soon. Well. I, I suppose there's probably two dimensions to that in terms of answering that question. I think the one that we need to just talk about quickly first is the fact that when we look at the statistics, and the mayor alluded to them last year, 656 death and serious injury accidents on our network, that's unacceptable. And that unfortunately comes at a cost to communities and to people's lives, but it also comes at a financial cost. Mm -hmm. So that, that costs the Auckland economy, $1.3 billion in terms of social cost. Um, so when you talk about can we afford to invest in road safety, I think the answer is pretty obvious. You can't afford not to Perfect. because we're actually investing already. 
But of course, then we do see our colleagues from the New Zealand Police here, and we welcome you. You do a great job. Um, but we need to all do this together. It's a multi-agency, um, and often the um, it's a multi-agency approach, and often the budgets and the approaches and the responsibilities are quite segregated or siloed, and that's something for us to think more about. We'll go back to uh, Rhys and Caroline, and. Um, you know, we've spoken a lot about roads and we've spoken a lot about design and a lot of other factors, but, you know, some people think it is the people, not the road, okay, to blame for this problem, speeding, drink driving, dangerous driving. How can any of those be the fault of anything other than the people themselves? That's a question, not a statement. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, as you say, it's a sort of a fairly common kind of discourse around that, that that's really about individual responsibility, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I think Matt's uh, referred to that in his talk. And it, it, for me, it comes from this sort of neoliberal ideology that seems to be permeating everywhere in our society, um, and which actually deflects attention from a lot of the structural and systemic and environmental factors that you know, as I've already said, I think we need to be focusing on because that's actually what works to, to change things. Um, if, we, if we design a system that relies on people not making mistakes, then we're destined to fail. Uh, that, that's a failed system and, and we need to be designing, you know, you, you just need to look to the airline industry and um, examples like that, that, uh, you know, design things so that people can make mistakes but they don't have fatal or very serious consequences, um, hopefully, most of the time. Um, so those, those are the sorts of things I think we need to be looking to. The, the other thing I would say about a, an individual responsibility focus is that it actually ends up increasing inequalities uh, because those people, that, uh, those people that are relatively privileged and are able to take up messages, are able to you know, have the resources to make those changes, uh, will benefit from those those interventions, whereas those who are struggling, um, those who don't have the privilege and the opportunities to do that, will, will end up uh, suffering and not being able to make the changes. So uh, I, I think a, an approach that, that relies on individuals taking responsibility as sort of the, the sole focus um, is wrong and will, you know, just create more problems. Oh. Yep. Um, I would agree with Rhys on a lot of his points there too. Um, and to... To add to that, I think, um, as Matt said in his presentation, the, the difference with Vision Zero is that shared responsibility and the fact that when something does happen, whilst it may be, have been caused by the road user, is actually going back and looking at, is there something within the design and the system that we could change and improve to mitigate um, something like that happening in future, prevent it from happening in future. We work with families who've been bereaved in road crashes and we see the devastating consequences of those crashes for families. Um, so it's about you know, what can we do to prevent these things happening in future and we know in terms of individual responsibility that that isn't everything um, when it comes down to, to the system and the, the transport design that we have. Um, but having said that, we all as road users and as people make conscious decisions. So we still all have a responsibility when we're using roads to do everything we can to keep ourselves and others safe because we're constantly making decisions and choices. So choosing, if you get behind the wheel after having drunk alcohol or you use your mobile phone at the wheel, that is a conscious decision. That's not making a mistake. That's okay. a decision you've taken. Thank you. Matt, I mean, you, you spoke a lot about what I would interpret as soft levers and subtle and kind of finessed approach to road safety and vision uh, zero. Um, but you did talk about cameras, but you never spoke about enforcement. So where does enforcement fit into vision zero? Because you obviously don't have the cameras up there for no purpose. Yeah. Well, enforcement is extremely important, especially in the, in the short run, mm. because we don't have a safe system. So we still have a system that we are very dependent on that people doing the right thing all the time. So, so police is important from that perspective. But what we try to do in the more uh, long run, we try to create something a little bit more sustainable. And of course, we, we always 
think, need the police. But, but we try to, uh, as a, I had a one example when it comes to, to drink and driving, for example, that, that uh, um, we can really solve this problem with, with technology. But the same thing when it comes to speed, you know. But, I'd, but we will not start with us as individuals. We, we don't start with us. Uh, in S Sweden, we call a, a typical Swedish person for Sanson. That's a, no, a very common uh, name. And we will not start with Sanson. We will start with organizations. We will start with those who are professional using the system. So for example, now, um, uh, municipalities, they are responsible for, for school transport in Sweden. And 90% of all uh, bus, school transport buses in Sweden, they have installed alkalogs. Because the municipalities now, they procure this kind of thing. So if the transport companies would like to make business with the municipality, uh, they have to install this kind of technology. And of course, we don't have a lot of uh, drunk uh, bus drivers that are driving around with, uh, with our kids. But the, this is not, the focus is, is really to start to implement things. So this is the first step. And they will probably pay a little bit more for this kind of technology. But when we see these things spreading, then the price for this technology will go down. So, so, so I think that uh, the organizations within a society has a great, uh, uh, it's extremely important to make this happen. So in uh, the Swedish Transport Administration, for example, we have a travel policy. So if you, have a, if you are the uh, manager and you have a, a, a car on duty, uh, that car will have alcohol, it will have intelligence, speed adaptation system, and so on. So, so, so we really we recognize that we have problem with behaviors and that sort of thing, uh, but we would like, in the long run, to solve it with technology. But before we are, have achieve all these things, we still are very dependent on enforcement, of course. So we, we're really down to the last couple of minutes. I'm going to ask each panelist just to... Uh, we'll start with Reese. If you had a magic wand and it came to road safety, for each of you, what are the first two things, very briefly, that you would wish for with your magic wand for road safety? Wow, that's a tricky one. Um, well, I mean, can I say vision zero? Is that yep. uh, <laughs> Something very brief, perfect. What else? Um, and I think when, when I'd say vision zero, I think I'd see that at a at a sort of policy level, yes. but also that being kind of socialized within our culture, because I think uh, we have a kind of problematic relationship with uh, motor cars and, uh, and, you know, transport environment in general. So I think changing that car culture. Carol, yeah. your magic wand, your wish. Um, yes, Vision Zero, obviously as well, from our point of view. <laughs> Look um, what you've done great. to us, Matt. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely Vision Zero, but and I would say, the, uh, one key part of that, 30, more 30 kilometre an hour limits in yes, urban centres and around limits, schools, yeah, lower yeah. speed limits. Andrew, you're the man who could answer that second question. I well, I'm, I'm not going to break the trend. I think Vision Zero is a great aspiration and that's where we need to head. Um, I, would, I would love to see a far less car dependent society, a far less car dependent Auckland, you know, more reliance on public transport and on active modes. I think that would stand us in really good stead moving forward. Perfect. And you've got one minute and 20 seconds to have the last word on the panel discussion, Matt. Well, <clears throat> from my perspective now, coming from Sweden, and see, and, and I, I have been involved in this process from the beginning, actually. Uh, and uh, 20 years with this uh, implementation of Sweden. Uh, and sometimes when I talk about this, it sounds like a very smooth, easy process. You know, everyone is happy and doing these things. But that has not been the case, you know. There are lots of conflicts, there are lots of things that we need to solve through this process. Uh, the good things now is that uh, uh, we are uh, lots of 
uh, different countries, different jurisdictions have to take this up and start to do things. So, so we have lots of learn from each other, I, I would say. So this is an excellent topic area for international collaboration. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, because we are doing things that is very new now, and we should not r reinvent the wheel on all these places now. We, we, we really need to collaborate. So I, I think I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll ask the panel to remain while we um, go through the question and answer session with the audience. I'll just make a point about paradigms and how we think. I was in Amsterdam just recently, and as you know, there's a, a massive bike culture there, just amazing. And I was in a cab as it happened, and um, we were waiting, and all these bikes were just going by, and you know, just had to wait and wait and wait. And I said to the cab driver, does this bother you, you know, waiting so long for all these people on their bikes? And he looked around at me sort of semi-dismissively, and he said, not as much as if they were all in cars. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and I thought, you know, massively mature mindset, uh, and, you know, that's something I think that we could learn a, a lot from. So we're going to open the floor to uh, questions, and we have a question over there. If you could keep your questions brief, please, that would be appreciated. Um, I just... <clears throat> wanted to raise one of the issues that is sort of paradoxical where we fix a piece of rural road, rural highway, by taking out the wriggly bits and making it straight and then people drive at even greater speed and have even more gory accidents. So the, the life is full of these sort of strange paradoxes but this is the one I've noticed particularly with our urban highways, uh, sorry rural highways, um, that there seems to be no ultimate solution because people will just mm. take advantage of the improved road mm. to go at an even greater pace. Andrew. Thank you for that. Um, I, I suppose probably two statements there. I think if you're going to straighten out your roads and encourage higher speeds then they need to be designed in a way that's, that's more forgiving and I think some of the slides that were, I'm not sure that no, it is working, um, I think some of the slides that were up earlier probably illustrate the sort of measures that can be put in place to make higher speeds more acceptable and more forgiving. So that's the separation, it's the barriers and perhaps the runoff road protection so that if you fall asleep at the wheel, um, you don't end up driving into a river or off a ravine, that sort of thing. So that's, I think it's possible to make straighter rural roads safer and, and have higher speeds that are acceptable. But equally, um, I think, a lot of our rural roads are relatively well self-explaining, to your point about the windy bits. Mm -hmm. The conundrum we've got in Auckland, and probably New Zealand for that matter, is we have a habit of putting 100k speed restrictions onto those windy roads, and we saw the Riverhead Absolutely. Coatesville example up here earlier. Mm -hmm. um, we're at a great point in time now where we've actually got the ability to make changes in that space, so we can accept that those roads don't need to be straightened out, but we do need a lower speed environment in those situations. And we do need an environment that's more forgiving. So those, to me, those roads are actually self-explaining. Their geometrics and their design dictate and lend itself to a driver understanding that you need to drive slower. Perfect. And we do have a lot of rural roads in Auckland. We have a question? Thank you very much. I haven't heard you mention anything about older people. Now, I am now an older person <laughs> and I get the bus when I can, but I haven't got a bus shelter. So imagine what it would have been like yesterday. Where I come, where I'm living, we had 25 millimetres of rain or hail. It was still around three hours later. So without a bus shelter up there, it is very difficult. Now, otherwise, where, when we come into town, where can we park? My husband was unable to walk very far at all. In fact, he became completely unable. But we had used to carry a little wheelchair in the back of the car. And so he would get there and use the wheelchair. But 
those places are getting fewer and fewer, so that would limit him altogether from getting anywhere with, unless he can park somewhere close. He's no longer with me, so that's all right. I haven't got that problem. But please, do consider, as people are getting older and older here, we're not all able to get on bikes. I can get on a bike, but I'm not very um, wanting to go anywhere particularly, just for pleasure. Okay, no, no, thank you. So, um, Matt, you did touch on, uh, you know, you thought that uh, crossing the road if you were older, yeah. it could have been quite difficult. How do we build in um, the right environment for our seniors, of which they're going to be more and more in the next 20 years in Auckland? The, those aged over 65 are going to double. Those aged over 75 are going to double. So over 65 is going to go from 220 to 440,000. That's a lot of people. We really need to keep uh, our seniors in mind. How do we get Vision Zero to be meaningful for our senior citizens? I think in, in general, if we plan and put the vulnerable road users on the top on our agenda, that will be important for all of us. So, so we have to change the way that we give priority to, to, uh, to things, I think. Uh, mm. so, so that might be one of yeah. those, yeah. I guess it's not happening quick enough, but intelligent mobility is going to be one of the most liberating um, new, um, I guess, technology um, applications for older people. Uh, it's just going to give them amazing opportunities for transport and effective transport and transport right to their door. Uh, that is just a few years away, but not too far. So um, we need to ensure that we have our most vulnerable citizens at the top of the list when we think about road safety. Do we have a next question, please? Just over there. Thank you very much. Um, last week at the um, Institute Traffic Conference in Nelson, uh, Matt spoke of, uh, and all the safety partners were given some information on the uh, highest fatality rating in New Zealand currently and the worst issue at the moment, one in four fatalities involve trucks. Now they don't necessarily involve the driver and we should be thinking and I hope that the panel can perhaps discuss that, how the, um, the mass component of travel is affecting our, our fatality rates. Who'd like to take that one on? No one jumping to their feet right at the moment, but we'll give them a few seconds. I, I suppose one of the comments, there's John out there, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose one of the comments I'd, I'd, I'd make is certainly, and I don't know the detail around all of those statistics and I wasn't at the conference, um, but we do certainly have an, an issue in terms of exposure for cyclists in that space, in terms of being pulled under wheels and trucks and, and not having the side protection. And I think that there's quite a bit of work that's being done at the moment at a national level to try and encourage the freight industry and the truckies um, to come to the party in terms of side protection on, on trucks to, to at least provide some sort of benefit for, for the cycle exposure, the cyclist risk exposure that we've got um, at the moment. Very good. Uh, further questions? Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just interested to know what the, how... Um, the panel think that automated vehicles will impact road safety in the future and what planning is being done around that? Uh, yeah, I think the safety community in general, they are quite sceptical about it. But from a Vision Zero point of view, we think that there are a really a uh, chance now and we need to take advantage of all this technology it's not all about these automated self-driving cars, but the, it's all the technology that will be needed to make that happen. And those technology will be very beneficial from a, from, a, from a safety point of view. We have lane departure system, auto brake systems, lots of these kind of technology. So, so we think that from a safety point of view, we will it was, will be a great benefit with, with things that happen. And, and uh, it's amazing of how quick it goes and how much um, 
uh, momentum it is in the whole discussion about automated driving. So for example, in Sweden now, in Gothenburg, uh, um, um, this, I think this year actually, we will have a large scale demonstration project with self-driving car. But it's not only about self-driving car, it's about the whole system because you have to have an infrastructure that provides for, for, for uh, uh, provides the, the, the right um, environment for these self-driving cars. So, so, um, so um, um, in short, we think that there is a r really an opportunity here from a safety point of view. So we've got a question just over there. Then, sir, you can take the hand down. You'll be next, and then you'll be after that with the white shirt. So could we have your question? Person with the microphone. Where is that? Oh, there you are. Um, I, uh, uh, Dr. Bellin, thank you for a, a very excellent address. And just before I ask a question, I did notice in one of your slides of hazards that you had elk. And I always remember when I was driving home in Vemlan one day, night from Sona, and I had an elk run right out in front of the road in front of me, out of the mist, and I nearly collected it. I just managed to swerve and avoid. But my question is, I was delighted, well, I'm delighted that you mentioned roundabouts. And I'm going to say that it's time that Auckland Transport took note, because in other cities or other t towns throughout New Zealand, I've seen lots of roundabouts, but Auckland Transport seem to be very adverse to them, and they like to use traffic lights. And the classic example is construction at the moment, which they will be well aware of, down on Tamaki Drive, Napipi Road, when the submissions and everyone wanted roundabouts, you went for traffic lights. And they cause, traffic lights cause more problems, and I see roundabouts seem to ensure the traffic flows steadily, less accidents and less problems. And I think you've made a very important point tonight. Andrew? Auckland Transport, take note. Thank you, and duly noted, obviously. Um, it's probably not worth getting into a debate about the, um, the benefits, the pros and cons between roundabouts and signalised intersections. But it is probably fair to say that we are focused on looking at roundabouts as a solution in appropriate locations. But roundabouts aren't necessarily the right solution in every situation. And it's certainly my firm opinion that when it comes to Tamaki Drive, a roundabout would have been a very difficult solution to implement. In fact, probably near on impossible to implement in that very and specific location. Especially if we were going to cater for the serious problem that we've got at that intersection, which is cycle safety because the footprint and the space that we have available to us without extensive reclamation just doesn't exist to be able to put a safety system in or a system that will cater, like we saw in some of the images up there, safely to cyclists and pedestrians. So, so I do note your point. I take it on board, and, and we are looking at using roundabouts more often. Um, it's part of how we're going to address the safety challenge in front of us. Thank you, sir. You've got the microphone. Uh, Matt, thank you. thank you for your address and uh, congratulations on the uh, reduction in uh, Sweden of road deaths. Um, what was our comparative per 100,000? This is a question for you. What is our comparative per 100,000 rate in Auckland and in New Zealand? to act as a kick up the arse to um, get us to compete with Stockholm and Sweden. The, the Auckland statistic, I believe, is three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three, three per 100,000. And New Zealand-wide? I, unfortunately, I don't know the statistic for our New Zealand-wide. I Zealand believe wide. at the moment it's around seven, mm. currently. 7.7 7 at the moment mm. for New Zealand-wide. Thank you. Uh, the next question, um, so we'll just go over there. If you could just take the microphone just behind you. Thank you. Thank you, yes. So uh, just getting back to attitudes, what I've always noticed traffic engineers emphasise this new change to the roading will decrease the travel time by so many minutes. 
and us motorists just interpret that we're getting there faster. And I think that's just the wrong emphasis. I think perhaps a challenge to traffic engineers emphasise this change will decrease the accident rate by so much. Nice point. Very good. I, I don't think that requires an answer. It was an answer in itself. Very good point. We'll take that on board. Uh, the, the next question, I think, was just up here. Yes. Is it a, are you able to... Oh, sorry. We'll take that one first. Uh, oh, okay. Just over here uh, in this third, second row. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I want to actually acknowledge the point that um, Reese made, Kira Rees. Um, he was talking about the way in which we address the issue of tobacco and what didn't work and what did. And I remember reading an article about our cars, the new tobacco. And you, we've talked a lot about the elephant in the room. From an Auckland transport perspective, apart from the nudges we could get by having better public transport and cycle safety, what are we really doing about having fewer people using cars? A lot. <laughs> in fact, um, you know, if you ever look at the um, public transport statistics, they are, are changing very dramatically. It just comes off a very low base. So without going into all the detail, you take, for example, um, uh, since we've introduced electric trains, um, uh, we have had a very significant success in massive uplift in uh, patronage. In fact, we're about four and a half years ahead of our business case, and we've just signed up for an additional set of 15 trains, that's 45 cars, and that's in advance of the CRL. But I think it's realistic to say that Auckland has very limited, currently very limited rapid transit. We've got the train and we've got the northern busway. So there's a number of other elements, the CRL, but that's time in the building. There's um, <clears throat> Amity, which is progressing at glacial pace. We would like to see that funded much more quickly because there's a huge solution there, but it's funded uh, very incrementally. Uh, of course, with the new government, light rail, which we've been a proponent of, it looks extremely likely. The Northwestern Busway or perhaps some other mode out there. So we are trying to develop a rapid transit because we know for a fact that where there's rapid transit, people use it very much. And a frequent network around that and then a connecting system, it takes time to develop. Um, but, uh, yeah, we are looking to have a real suite of modal options. But modal options are insufficient in themselves to get the massive problem of car dependency addressed. And that's an attitudinal issue, and that's something we have to take a different approach to. We've actually got a chance for perhaps one or two last questions. We've got one over here, and then you, sir, then we'll be done. Thank you for the great presentation. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. That was uh, uh, very um, eye-opening. It's one of those um, these slides you have shown with the two plus one lanes uh, with the median barrier in the, in the middle. What is the speed environment and where would you recommend that to be implemented? <clears throat> so, We have a quite large, uh, we used to have a quite large uh, network with 90 kilometers. So uh, when we installed this middle barrier, we were actually able to increase the speed to 100 kilometers. So these roads have 100, most of them have 100 kilometers. Um, um, so, so it works very well from a, from a safety perspective uh, up to 100 kilometers. And, and if you don't have this middle barrier, we will have 80 kilometers instead. Okay, we're down to the last question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And But towards the end of the presentation, Matt, you mentioned that demonstration projects were probably the way to get the ball rolling. Okay. Um, you can take a... I appreciate hearing from you perhaps what was a very successful demonstration project in... Uh, in Sweden, in Stockholm, or somewhere else in the world, or you might like to take on the big challenge of saying uh, what do you think might be a good demonstration project in New Zealand after your brief experience here. 
Okay, for us it was important to show that this is not rock and science. So we actually build, uh, you know, uh, we are part of the European Union, so we have um, rolling um, um, uh, chairman of the European Union. So, so when we were in charge for European Union, we, we decided to do a lot of things. We, we did, and we, we <coughs> organized a meeting with all politicians from Europe, Europe and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we did some demonstration project, both in the urban area and the rural area. And in that time, we also have Saab, you know, the, the car, the Saab. And they um, provide cars with alkalox and that sort of thing, because we wanted to show uh, both the public, of course, but also all these politicians that, that uh, this is not rock and science. We have lots of good solutions that we can start to implement, uh, implement. And I think that was a very important demonstration project, actually. So, so, and, and we work very systematically with, with these kind of I think to, to, uh, to show how it works and so on. So, so I think that is very good to, to make things uh, happen. So thank you very much for your questions. Uh, sorry if we don't have a chance to take all of them. So before we close, we're going to ask Pippa Coom, Chair of the Waitamata Local Board, uh, to make the vote of thanks. Pippa, thank you. Namahinui kia koutou. Kia ora, everybody. And thank you, Lester, for the invite to um, close the Auckland Conversations this evening and to give the vote of thanks. I'm really proud to be chair of the Waitamata Local Board, the first local board to adopt Vision Zero as a target in our local board plan. Um, and I'd really like to acknowledge the road safety campaigners and advocates who have been working to create safer streets and first brought the possibility, brought the first, first brought the possibility of Vision Zero to New Zealand a few years ago, um, and it's really directly influenced my thinking. And I found it very heartening to hear Lester say that Auckland Transport is going through a review of their road safety approach. Um, this is a really positive sign, and I think there are many positive signs of change is coming not just at Auckland Transport, um, but at the government level. Um, and I met um, Dr. Billin at um, Traffins last week, where he was the keynote speaker, and acknowledgements to the um, deputy chair of Traffins. It's the road safety um, conference. It's held an annually and organised by the local authority Traffic Institute of New Zealand that was held in, those, in Nelson last week. And the, particularly the NZTA officials there really gave us a teaser of what we can expect from the new government that wants to make a difference. And Minister, um, the new Minister of Transport, Phil Twyford, has asked for safety and Vision Zero to be part of a new transport action plan. And so I just think this is amazingly perfect time that Matsoka is, is here in New Zealand. So I'd really like to congratulate whoever made that happen. Um, I think the stars are aligning. So what I really take from Matt's presentation, for his very straight up presentation, delivered with a very special Scandinavian dry sense of humour, um, I think it's really easy to understand. And we, um, the politicians, the planners, engineers, leaders in this room, police enforcement, it's good to see you here as well. I really think the whole road safety community, we know what we have to do. And as we heard from Matsoka, we have to be brave. Change can be difficult and we will be in the firing line, and Auckland Transport is certainly experiencing that quite a lot at the moment as we go through huge change in Auckland. But safe mobility for everyone, I'm convinced, will bring social, environmental, and economic benefits for our communities. Did I mention health there as well, Rhys? Absolutely. 
Um, so just before I do get to the thanks, I would just like to mention that this Sunday is the World Day of Remembrance for Road Crash Victims. And BREAK, with Caroline Perry, it's great that Caroline's on the panel, is organising at Silo Park at 3 p.m. is a stand for zero. So if you'd like to come along and be part of a, a giant zero that we're going to create down on Silo Park, we invite you all to come along. And you can find the event details on Facebook. Um, I'm sure everyone here has been touched by, um, in some way, by a crash. And um, the mayor made his own personal um, reference to that. So I just wanted to say, and I said, I thought to myself, I'm not going to do this if I can't say it properly. But I will be there standing for my dad, who was um, exactly the same age I am when he, when he was killed 20 years ago in a crash that would not have happened if a safe system approach incorporating Vision Zero was in place. But we will do that remembering on Sunday. Right now, I really would like to end in a positive way with a big ho mai te paki paki for all the people that we must thank for this evening. And of course, our keynote speaker, our international guest, who I've really been delighted to hear from Matsuoka, Dr. Berlin, this week. I think this is the fourth time I've heard him present, and it's every time it's, I get something from it. So thank you, Dr. Berlin, for your presentation. And we're really fortunate to have you in New Zealand. I'd like to thank the panelists, Andrew Allen. You, you're bracing yourself for change at the organisation that Lester and the new CEO are bringing along. Um, Caroline Perry, it's great to work with you on safe, road safety. And Dr. Rhys Jones, I think this um, bringing together health and transport is so important. So thank you to our panellists for taking part in the, the discussion. Of course, thanks to our MC, Lester Levy. I don't know how you do it with wearing so many hats, but um, you are formidable with your, your work output put. Um, thanks to our very busy Mayor, uh, Mayor Goff, um, for opening the conversation, and he did stay for the whole of um, Matt Spocker's presentation, so that's just fantastic. And thank you for the organisers of Auckland Conversations, to the sponsors and supporters. I know a huge amount of work goes into putting on these events, and we're really fortunate that we can come together to hear from amazing speakers from around the world. So most importantly, I would like to thank the audience. Thank all of you for coming along this evening. This is a wrap for Auckland Conversations um, for not, sorry, not forever, <laughs> just a wrap for 2017. Um, I should also mention thanks to those who are watching live and when you, when you go onto Twitter and you see all the tweets of um, Auckland Conversations hashtag, you can get a sense that we do have a much wider audience that joins us for these conversations, not just everyone who's in the room. So that's, that is it for this evening. And I do welcome you back for next year for Auckland Conversations. The first event will be on the 28th of February. So if you could join me in a big round of applause for everybody who's taken part in this evening. And thanks. <laughs>